Hi, I'm Valerie Crow with Cobb and Douglas Public Health. Welcome to Spotlight on Public Health. Today we will be discussing summer safety, and then later in the program we will discuss nutrition and summer activities. My first guest is Viva Price, Children and Youth Section Manager with the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Program. Viva, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. Viva, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about the Safe Kids Coalition? Yes. Safe Kids Cobb County uh, is a coalition comprised of about 40 different agencies. Um, it's been proudly led by Cobb and Douglas Public Health and Wellstar Health System for over 25 years and is part of the larger Safe Kids Worldwide Network, which has over 400 coalitions worldwide and over 30 here in the state of Georgia. Um, through our strong partnerships with people like Cobb and Douglas uh, Public Health, through um, public safety, and with Metro Atlanta Ambulance Services and the Wellstar Foundation, we're able to provide a lot of uh, injury prevention services throughout the county. Okay, great. Our first topic is water safety and drowning prevention. Uh, why is this important to learn about water safety and drowning prevention? Well, people drown when too much water gets into their lungs. Um, when too much water is in their lungs, their lungs aren't able to pump out oxygen into the blood, and because of that, the brain and the rest of the body doesn't get the oxygen that it needs. Um, drowning is typically called the silent killer a lot of times because it can take less than a minute for it to occur, um, and over 800 children die each year from drownings. And in addition to that, in addition to the drownings, for each child that drowns, there are at least five that go to the emergency room from near drowning incidents. Mm. Okay, and what age group has the highest drowning death rate? Well, children who are under four have the highest drowning death rate. Um, for infants who are under one, the home is typically the location where drownings occur most often, uh, primarily in the bathtubs, and even in places like uh, the toilet uh, or even large buckets of water. Okay, and where do most drownings occur? For infants, the majority of drownings occur in the home, in places like the bathtub, and even in places like the toilet or in large buckets of water, because they're a little top heavy. Um, for one to four year olds at home swimming pools, and for five to 17 year old natural bodies of water, such as lakes, creeks, ocean, things like that. Okay, and you mentioned swimming pool deaths. Do these deaths typically occur at home or at a public or community pool? Well, between eight and nine out of 10 of these deaths actually occur um, at home for children who are under five. And a little under half of the fatalities among children five to 14 occur at public swimming pools. Okay, and what about fencing? How important is fencing around pools? Well, we know it's really important to keep barriers uh, in place to prevent children from having access to pools. So Georgia law actually states that anyone um, who's a homeowner that has a pool on their uh, property is mandated to have four foot fencing around and the fencing also can't have more than four inches below. Um, with that, the home is actually counted at some points. Sometimes the, the home itself can count as one of the barriers. Um, however, if there are four-sided fencing as opposed to three, it's been proven to reduce the risk of death by 83%. Oh, wow, okay. And what about pool drains? We hear a lot about that. Do we need to worry about drains? Yes, actually between 1990 and 2005, there were about 100 different reported cases of uh, entrapment. So it is something to still worry about. Now, especially for those pools that were built prior to 2009, um, they may not have updated features, uh, like uh, there's been a different drain cover, that there have been some updates so that it can prevent entrapment. Okay, and now isn't there some sort of law about pool drains? Or? There is, so that's, okay. why, that's uh, the ref when I referenced the uh, pools okay. that were made 2000, uh, okay. since 2009. So the Virginia uh, Baker Graham bill um, is what mandates that the drains themselves have operable covers, um, that they were replaced with uh, drains that uh, prevented entrapment and also had vacuum release valves. Okay. And then what about boating accidents? Um, what can you tell me about boating accidents? Well, in 2012, 71% of fatal boating accidents, uh, victims drowned. Mm -hmm. And of those, nearly 90% were not wearing a life jacket. So we know it's really important for them to wear those personal flotation devices. Okay, and I've heard about the life jacket loaner stations. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a program in Cobb County or? There is, tell, there okay. is, I'm excited to tell about that. Okay. Um, actually, Safe Kids is partnered with Cobb Parks, um, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Lake Alatuna Water Safety Task Force, and also with Ackworth Parks and Rec to create different loaner stations around our county. So at all of the area swimming pools that are public, um, there are loaner stations that are available for free for people to use with all different sizes from infant life jackets all the way up to adults. And the same thing is uh, true of our lake properties. And we've also partnered with the YMCA to provide 
provide some life jackets as well. Oh, that's great. All right, um, do you have some water and drowning safety tips that you can give us? Yes. Um, one, as far as home safety goes, make sure you empty buckets, wading pools, and other containers immediately after use and store them upside down and out of reach. Um, children should only swim in designated and supervised areas and teach children never to go near a pool drain with or without a cover and to pin up long hair when they're actually in the water. Um, teach children to never swim alone and always use the buddy system and use barriers to keep kids away from water when you're not around. Um, in about nine out of 10 drownings, there's actually an adult that's present. Mm -hmm. So it's important that adults are actually actively supervising youth, which means they're not on their phones, they're not reading a book, that they are actually doing nothing else besides supervising them. And also if they are pre-K age, they need to be within reach when they're at the pool. Also, we say that um, they can use the Water Watcher Tag program, which Safe Kids promotes. Um, and that's a program where if there's a group of adults, you have a tag that identifies that you're the person who's in charge of supervising the youth at that point, and you alternate. So for 15 minutes, you might wear the tag, and then you might pass it off to another adult that's present. Um, finally, if you don't swim the best, we say to put on a vest. So like we mentioned, the life jacket loaner stations, we recommend that th the kids use them, and even adults use them as well, um, and that they always wear U.S. Coast Guard approved personal flotation devices. Okay, great. All right, our next topic is bicycle and helmet safety. Uh, what is bicycle safety? So bicycle safety is essentially just uh, teaching youth how to, uh, or actually teaching anyone, how to use follow road traffic safety signs uh, to reduce the risk associated with cycling. Okay, and then as far as helmets go, um, why do we need to wear a helmet? Well, helmets reduce the risk of head injury by as little as 45 percent, and one study actually says as much as 88 percent as far as brain injury. Um, risk being reduced. And they also reduce the risk of fatal injury by 30%. Um, almost three quarters of fatal crashes involved a head injury and nearly all bicyclists who died from those, from those crashes, 97% that is, uh, weren't wearing a helmet. Mm. It's also extremely important to know that over half of, of children who um, were questioned in a Safe Kids Worldwide report actually stated that they don't wear their helmets all of the time. So mm. even though they might have them, they don't actually use them. All right, and can you explain how you wear a bicycle helmet? I mean, how is it supposed to fit? Yeah, so first, the helmet should actually sit um, level on your head. Um, there shouldn't be more than two fingers between the eyebrow and where the helmet starts. And if the child is wearing the helmet or the adult, they should be able to look up and see the rim of the helmet. Next, um, the straps themselves should actually make V's around the ear, so V's on each side. Um, and also, when the helmet is secured, it shouldn't fit loosely. There should only be one finger that can fit between the chin strap and the strap itself. Uh, and finally, when they move their, sides, their head from side to side and front to back, then the helmet should fit securely on their head. And one other tip is after the helmet is secured, it might fit a little bit tight, and that's okay. Um, what you could do is just go, ah, and open your mouth, and it'll actually make the helmet hug the top of your head and make sure that it's secure. Oh, great. All right, and is there a certain way to measure your head for a bike helmet? There is. Um, just above your eyebrows, if you were to take a measuring tape and actually just go around the circumference of your head um, with an even loop, then that should give you the measurement for your, for your helmet. Also, on a majority of helmets, they'll have, for children and for adults, they'll have a recommended age associated as well as the size. All right, and then is there a law in regards to wearing a bike helmet? There actually is. Anyone who's under the age of 16 is required to wear a helmet in Georgia. Um, and Georgia is one of a few states that, has, that actually has that law. So only 21 states in the District of Columbia um, actually have statewide bicycle helmet laws. Okay. And are there any helmet safety tips that you can provide to us? Yeah. Always wear a helmet when you're on wheels, uh, in, outside of bicycles, including skateboards, um, scooters, and actually hoverboards as well. Um, make it a rule that every time your child is on the wheels, once again, that they wear their helmet, wear, wear it properly, and that it also meets or exceeds safety standards um, that are established by the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, those helmets, need to make sure, you need to make sure they've not been involved in a crash, that they um, aren't in a state where they need repair, so there aren't a bunch of scratches, um, and that they fit properly. Uh, so make sure that the helmet is comfortable and snug, but not too tight. Um, and like we talked about a little while ago, it should sit centered on the top of your head in a level position um, securely. And also, if a child is reluctant to wear a helmet, have them participate in picking out what the helmet is that they want. They're more likely to wear it if they actually like it. Sure. 
All right, next on our list is pedestrian safety. Uh, why are children at the greatest risk for pedestrian accidents? Well, 61 kids are hit every day in the U.S. Um, by cars. Uh, children are at greatest risk because they don't really have the ability to make good decisions yet. So they may not be able to, um, to gauge how long it's going to take a car to get to them um, or how fast a car is going. And also they're a little impulsive, so they might think, oh, should I stop? And they might decide, decide at the last minute to run out to the street. Um, and also, children believe that cars can stop instantly and, you know, that if, it, if they see a car, that the driver might actually see them. So. Is there anything that parents or caregivers can do to help with this? Yeah. Um, parents can make sure that their children are wearing brightly colored clothing, um, that they understand the rules of the road. If their children are under 10, they can actively supervise them and walk whatever pathways they, uh, the child will be going on. And also um, wear reflective materials. So since the majority of incidents take place, you know, when, when the sun is going down or after school, actually cars can see children better if they're wearing reflective materials and brightly colored clothing. What safety tips should we teach our children? Walk when crossing the street. Don't run. Cross at street corners. Go straight, not at a diagonal line. Stop at the curb and look left, right, and then left again before they actually cross the street. If there are no cars, then they can cross after they've made eye contact with the drivers. And teach children to watch for cars turning from side streets as well. Um, they're used to adults looking out for them, so they may not necessarily be aware of all the dangers. Um, and not to cross behind parked cars or bushes. Um, finally, be extra careful in bad weather. It's harder for drivers to stop or slow down, even if they do see you. Okay, good. Those are some great tips. All right, well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about hot car safety. Um, what can you tell me about hot car safety? Well, children actually heat up about three to five times faster than adults do. And within 10 minutes, your car can heat up 15 degrees hotter than the temperature is outside. Within an hour, that could actually increase to being 40 degrees, especially on a scorcher in Georgia summers. Wow. Um, and how many children die each year from being left in a hot car? About 38 children die each year from being left in a hot, hot car. Um, over half of those are actually reported by parents to have been forgotten. Mm. So just parents that are busy multitasking, accidentally leaving them. And a little under one third of them actually gained access to the car uh, that was unoccupied. So a toddler, for example, might have grabbed the keys and gotten into the mm. car, but they get in trouble and can't get themselves out. Uh, and those, those injuries also range from age zero to 14, but over 80% of them are children who are under three. Oh, wow. All right, and can you talk a little bit about how quickly a car gets hot internally? Right, so um, as I mentioned, it might get, uh, you know, the car could heat up 10 degrees within, you know, a few minutes um, and 40 degrees within an hour. So if it's a 72 uh, degree day, then that would be, you know, 112 degrees inside. Wow. What's really important about this is that children's body systems actually start to shut down at 104 degrees. And like I mentioned, they heat up much more rapidly than we do. Um, they actually can die at 107 degrees. Mm. Uh, any additional tips for our viewers? Yeah, so we want to encourage parents to act. So um, when it's important for them to make reminders. So avoid leaving the child behind in the car. If uh, they change their schedule, make sure they have a stuffed animal in the front seat beside them or put their purse or their bag in the back seat where the child is so that they are then motivated to turn around. And remember, always look before you lock. Because even though, like you said, they may not have had the child in the car, you may have changed your schedule, you can always have an additional precaution. Um, and finally, to create reminders, like I said before, you can also put your cell phone in the back seat since we shouldn't be using it while we're driving. Um, and then finally, take action. So if you see that a child is left behind in a car, call 911 um, and await their advisement. Great. Well, Viva, you have really given us some great information today. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for having me. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Lisa Gardner and I'm from Safe Kids Cobb County and I'm here to talk to you about water safety. You never think it could happen to your family, but each year 800 children drown. These incidences are preventable and predictable. I'm here today to talk to you about water safety tips that can keep your children safe around water. Children drown quickly and silently in a matter of seconds. Adults who were present when a child drowns were often distracted in some way by talking on the phone, chatting with other adults around the pool, or reading. What can you do about it? 
actively supervise your children around water and have a phone nearby to call for help in an emergency. When there are several adults present and children are swimming, use a water watcher card to designate an adult as the water watcher to prevent gaps in supervision. Water watcher cards help adults actively supervise young swimmers. Active supervision is the first step in preventing a child from drowning in a pool, hot tub, or in open water such as a lake or pond. A water watcher card is a physical reminder to the adult holding this card that they are watching the children as they swim. They promise not to engage in any other poolside activities that lead them to lack of supervision. After about 15 minutes or a set amount of time, they pass that card to another adult who then becomes the water watcher supervisor. Curious children, especially those younger than four years old, can easily find and fall into bodies of water like pools, tubs, and buckets. Often they are discovered too late to save. Never leave a child alone when in or near a body of water, even if it's less than a few inches. For pool owners, make sure your pool has four-sided fencing and a self-closing, self-latching gate. Hot tubs should be covered and locked when not in use. Fencing for pools should completely enclose the pool or spa and prevent direct access from a house or yard. Drowning victims who are rescued from the water need CPR immediately, even before the paramedics arrive. This will help with brain damage and be the difference between life or death. What can you do about this? Get certified. There are plenty of CPR classes available to meet busy schedules. To register for a CPR class through Wellstar, call 770-956-STAR. Children from a non-swimming household are eight times more likely to drown. So what can you do? Enroll your child in a swim class. If you don't know how to swim, then enroll yourself in a parent-child learn to swim class. To find swimming lessons, contact your local parks and recreation department by visiting www.cobbcounty.org or go through Wellstar by calling 770-956-STAR. Over 5,000 boating accidents occur each year in open water, such as lakes, rivers, and ocean. Over 700 people drown. Of those people, 9 out of 10 are not wearing a life jacket. What can you do about it? Have your child wear a Coast Guard-approved life jacket every time you participate in any type of water activity like swimming and boating. A personal flotation device, life jacket, should fit snugly and not allow the child's chin or ears to slip through the neck opening. Don't rely on inflatable swimming toys such as water wings and inner tubes. They are not safety devices and should never be substituted for personal flotation devices. For more information on water safety and preventing drowning, visit us at www.safekidscobbcounty.org. Children eat well and move a lot, and move a lot, and move a lot, eat well and move a lot. 60 minutes of physical activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. So keep them active and eating well every day. Skip a rope Saturday, freeze tag Friday, tap dance Thursday. All the healthy children. Get ideas. Get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. Welcome back to Spotlight on Public Health. My next guest is Allison Curtis, Physical Activity and Nutrition Manager under the Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention Program. Allison, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Allison, let's start off by talking about sun safety. Why is sun safety important? 
Well, when the weather gets nice, it's a great time to get out and enjoy the outdoors. But a lot of people don't realize all the potential dangers of sun exposure. And it's important for people of all skin types to take protective measures and to also to protect not only themselves, but their other family members from the damaging um, rays of the sun. All right, and what is the recommended clothing when, when, when you're out in the sun? Tightly woven clothing in dark or vibrant prints is the recommendation for the best protection. Loosely woven or thin clothing can actually allow UV rays to get through to your skin. And the enhanced pigmentation of the darker and vibrant colors actually absorb some of the UV rays to help protect you. Um, something else to note is that both worn and faded fabrics actually lose their protectivity and that when clothes become wet, they lose 30 to 50% of their protective quality. Wow. Is there a certain time of day when the sun is the strongest and most dangerous? Yes, so the American Academy of Dermatology recommends to avoid being out in the sun between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., particularly April through October. But any time you're going to be spending an extended period outside during any of the daylight hours at any time of year, we would recommend using some protection. All right, and what about sunscreen? Um, what does the sunscreen's SPF number mean? And what is SPF? So SPF, the sun protection factor, is a multiplication factor for the amount of time protection you will get when you're out in the sun. So for example, if someone's fair skinned and they may burn within 20 minutes, using SPF of 15 would actually give them up to 300 minutes of protection from that damage. But of course you do have to take into consideration factors like if you're going to be in water or excessive sweating, you're going to decrease that time amount. Okay, and at what age can parents or caregivers begin applying sunscreen to infants? Well, ideally babies under six months should not be in direct sunlight. Um, the American Medical Association does advise that at six months of age you can start using sunscreen on babies, but since their skin is so much more sensitive, the American Academy of Dermatology does recommend to still try and keep them in shade and out of the sun as much as possible and to give them protective clothing as an added barrier, so long sleeves, long pants, wide brimmed hat, and sunglasses. Okay, great. Can you offer some tips regarding sunscreen to our viewers? Yes, um, there's actually quite a few that I can recommend for you. Um, so when you're choosing a sunscreen, you wanna look for a minimum SPF of 15 and 30 and 50 would be preferred. You also wanna make sure that it's water resistant or waterproof and you wanna use a broad spectrum. That will cover both UVA and UVB rays. Um, always check the expiration date and if you do have an expired product, discard it. You need to make sure that you're applying the sunscreen generously and that you rub it in thoroughly. For most adults, you would need a half ounce to an ounce to fully cover all of your exposed skin. And also to make sure that you remember all areas such as your face, your neck, including your ears, tops of your feet, and if you have hard to reach areas, to have someone help you or use a spray. Is there a difference between the lotions and the sprays? The lotions would be preferable for better protection, um, but you know sprays will definitely give you an added benefit. And then um, a few other tips is that to make sure that you allow at least 15 minutes for it to fully absorb in. So if you are concerned about your vitamin D, you can apply just before you go outside. That will give you enough sun exposure to absorb the vitamin D and then still get the sun protection. Um, and if you have thin or very short cropped hair, we do advise putting the sunscreen on your scalp or wearing a wide brimmed hat for protection. I mean, to protect your lips, you want to wear a lip balm with an SPF of at least 15 and to reapply your sunscreen at least every two hours to remain protected. All right, and is there anything else that you would like to add about sun safety? Um, some things that we would like you know, for people to be aware of is both hydration and then heat stroke. So especially when you're spending time outside, you're going to be you know, excessively sweating and whatnot, you're going to need to hydrate more. Most people are familiar with the 8 by 8 rule, which is to have 8 glasses of 8 ounces of water. Um, but we advise a little bit differently than that. It's a great rule to start with, but to drink a half ounce of water um, for every pound. So if you weighed 150 pounds, you'd actually want to have 75 ounces of water during the day. For children, after 20 minutes of play, we do advise that they take 10 gulps of water, and a gulp would be a half ounce to help keep them hydrated. And know the signs of dehydration, such as flushed skin, feeling weakness, um, feeling fatigued easily, faster breathing, rapid heart rate, and then that can get advanced. Um, those symptoms may be dizziness, increased weakness, and labored breathing. And then for heat stroke, um, one of the first symptoms can be fainting but the hallmark symptom is having an internal body temperature of 104 degrees. Um, additional symptoms could be a throbbing headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, um, lack of sweating despite the heat, having red, hot, or dry skin, 
muscle weakness or cramps, nausea and vomiting. And if you're having any of these type of symptoms, we would you know, advise you to seek medical advice. Sure, okay. All right, well now let's talk a little bit about summer break and nutrition. Um, why is it important for families to watch their nutrition habits during the summer break? Well, overall, um, just to kind of give a recap of overall nutrition, overweight and obesity is a health epidemic in the United States with two thirds of adults and one third of children being overweight or obese. And then within that, um, poor nutritional habits and lack of physical activity are directly linked with overweight overweight and obesity, and then overweight and obesity are risk factors for chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, and some types of cancers. And then poor nutritional habits um, can include things such as overconsumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, um, highly processed foods which are high in calories, they can be also high in sugars, fats, and salt, and that there's also an underconsumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, which those offer a great you know, nutritional need to cover things such as fiber, complex carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and then health benefiting antioxidants. So when our nutritional patterns can be disrupted when there are changes in our routine or schedule like during summer break, and especially when we go on vacation. And when that happens, when we have those disruptions, we have a tendency um, to get off course and to do poor nutritional habits. So the summertime can actually be a great time to focus on that and to make improvements because you're gonna have so much fresh produce readily available and at the best, best prices of the season. All right, and what do you recommend for families to help them increase their nutritional habits? Um, one of the first things I would say is you know, to check out the USDA's myplate.gov and they have recommendations so when you're thinking about your meals, half your plate should be full of fruits and vegetables, a quarter should be lean proteins, and then a quarter should be healthful grain options. Um, to replace fried foods with baked, grilled, or steamed options, to replace sugary beverages and sports beverages with water, lower calorie and low sugar options. So for example, adding some fruit into your water for some flavor, or for an alternative to soda, adding sparkling water to fruit juice um, so that it will reduce the calories and the sweetness. Um, keeping fruit readily available, it's the original fast food. So just have it ready to go and during the summer it should be plentiful and less expensive. Um, replacing sweets, candies, and snacks with lower calorie options such as fruit, cut up vegetables, cheese sticks, low fat yogurt, or having things on hand such as sugar free jello pudding or popsicles. Uh, monitoring your portions by you know, using measuring cups and spoons and also becoming familiar with how to read nutrition labels. Then limit fast food and dining out to two times per week. And lastly, but very importantly, to um, avoid distracted eating. So turn off all electronic devices. So no TVs, computers, social media, cell phones when you're eating. When we're distracted when we're eating, we tend to eat more than we need to. So we really want them to be mindful of what they're eating, how much they're eating, and just slow down and enjoy the food. All right, and my last question, uh, physical activity, it's also important. Can you recommend some summer activities for Cobb County residents? Sure, there's a lot of great things that they can take advantage of. You know, we want to encourage everyone to be more physically active, active and to get in the 30, 60 minutes each day. So we'd say take advantage of all the parks and recs that we have here in Cobb County and also local and national um, federal parks to look into the loaner bike program that's part of Town Center and KSU. A lot of those offer those bike things for free for the first few hours. Look into local events. Um, also summer programming that can be offered through summer camps, youth centers, aquatic centers, community pools, and even your library. And just try something new. Sign up for a class or um, join a group. And I particularly remember that when you're going to be on vacation, even if it's a staycation. Great. Well, Allison, thank you so much for joining me today to, to discuss sun safety, physical activity, and nutrition. I really appreciate it. Thank you. For more information about what we discussed this afternoon or for any more information about Cobb and Douglas Public Health, visit our website at cobbanddouglaspublichealth.org or call 770-514-2300. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time.